questions God wants to ask you. Day 8. What is that in your hand? The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. Exodus 4 verse 2. I'm uncomfortable. I'm scared. I feel awkward. I'm squeamish. I'm not good at that. I can't. I'm not able. These are the kinds of answers you give when you think something is impossible for you. Most of the time, it's not so much about the tension between the possible and the impossible, but rather about feeling less than able and thinking of those who can do it better. If you were asked to preach, you might say, no way, if I have to go up front and speak, I will die immediately. Yet in truth, more people will die while vigorously brushing their teeth than you will ever die by saying a few words up front. You can say, I'm terrified, uncomfortable, awkward, and totally convinced that others are more skilled. And that is likely the truth. However, when you are actually asked to do something for which you feel unprepared, unqualified, and unable, what is your answer? Driving on a dark, rainy night, three teenagers witnessed how the car ahead of them swerved to the side of the road and hit a tree. They unwaveringly stopped to help. When they approached the wreckage, they found a woman unconscious in the driver's seat and two children crying in the back. Another car also stopped and a woman joined them and began to assess the situation. She said, I'm a nurse and I've already called for help and for an ambulance. Can you help me? The three girls, who were about 17 years old, didn't feel like they could do anything, but they automatically nodded. After checking the driver's vitals, the nurse spoke calmly but firmly. I need some help. The mother's leg and side are bleeding and the children need to be removed from the car in their seats. Two of the teenagers unhooked the car seats and carefully took the children into their car for safety, whilst the remaining student heard the nurse's voice calling out to her. You, please, help me stop the bleeding. The nurse found some clothes to put pressure on the wound and instructed the girl, hold this cloth tight on her leg right here. The girl confessed, the sight of blood makes me dizzy. I'll be sick, I'll throw up. Still in a calm but commanding voice, the nurse replied, you can sit down next to her and be dizzy if you want. You can throw up if you want to. Just make sure you keep pressure on the wound. She kept pressure and threw up a couple of times as well. But when the ambulance came, the whole family was spared. Clearly, sometimes we are asked not because we are able, but because we are available. When God called Moses to be the mouthpiece for freedom, Moses replied with a series of excuses on why he was unable. God heard Moses' reservations and replied, what is that in your hand? At that moment, God had introduced himself as the I Am and described the mission of a massive revolution in Egypt. God had told Moses why, what, when, where and how the exodus would occur, only to find Moses sick with uncertainty. I can hear Moses saying, great plan, everything down to the details. It's a perfect plan except for one small problem, me. You might be the I am, but I am who I am, and that doesn't look good for your plan. The eternal God with a master plan to rescue two million people from Egypt, then stops to ask, what is that in your hand? Obviously, God knows the item in question is a stick. God knows that Moses knows that his staff is just a stick. You know the story. But let's read it again. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. 
So Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. Exodus 4, verses 2 to 4. The Bible is filled with moments where God uses ordinary things to do extraordinary acts for God's kingdom. What is that in your hand? The staff in your hand is your attention. Throughout your day, you take in everything you see. However, you don't see everything you take in. The human mind creates habits of thought and perception, so after a while you will miss the regular patterns unless you look carefully. If you were to look for the colour orange, you would seek, focus on and identify the colour orange. You wouldn't notice so much orange around if you weren't attentive. John Stilgo is a Harvard professor who teaches about the history of landscape. His class is really about seeing and noticing things. If you were in that class and you found yourself gazing out the window, you might be doing your homework already. Becoming skilled in paying attention to the world around you is key to being successful. If you only see what you already believe, your lens for seeing life diminishes every day. Paying attention opens doors to new opportunities to cooperate with people. When you look in the Gospels, you will discover the phrase, Jesus saw her, or Jesus saw the multitudes. Jesus paid attention. Do you see well? Do you ever walk, see the masses, and never consider the soul of any one of them? God uses people who are paying attention. Much like Moses who saw a strange burning bush and responded, God can use anyone who is available to answer, here I am. Perhaps you feel you are unskilled and unprepared. Perhaps you feel uncertain about whether you are 100% committed to God. Well, get in line and join the club. Still, God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary tasks for his plan. What is that in your hand? God wants your attention and he also needs your effort. It's not a contradiction to say God uses your weaknesses and then say give your best to God. Paul shared a conversation about strengths and weaknesses with the Corinthians. God had spoken to him directly. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12 verses 9 and 10. Consider the Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. All the names listed are not heroes, nor did they always act in a heroic way. But they all answered, I am here. Are you available? Peter adds to the conversation about the effort part in our cooperation with God. After reminding the believers that they are saved by God's grace, his advice is, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. 2 Peter 1 verses 5 to 7. For those who are willing to give all to God, there is a journey of growth as a result. But don't mistake the cooperation with God that produces growth with accepting God's salvation as a gift. The growth comes from being available. 
your eternal salvation is receiving the gift of grace given at the cross. It's easy to get confused because both growing and accepting God's grace happen in a relationship with God. Peter clarifies this even more when he says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. 2 Peter 1 verses 8 and 9 If you struggle with guilt and disappointment from all of your broken promises and uncompleted commitments to God in the past, read that passage again. You are not lost, but you have an eye problem. Like Moses, it's common to be tempted to see your own abilities and shortcomings instead of seeing God's calling for your life. To see yourself, your skills and abilities, or even your personality as the source, is nearsighted. God invites you to come on a journey with your staff in your hand that he will use. God uses your attention and your effort. But there is still one more staff that you possess in your hand that God asks you to think about. Today is the most useful gift you have to give to God. When you wait to surrender yourself to God's call, your procrastination takes a toll on your heart. You are quietly and continually pestered by your indecision, which in turn causes guilt and shame. Avoiding, delaying, denying and distracting yourself becomes your focus. This will only prevent you from finding the peace, joy and love you hope for. The lie is to think you can wait until tomorrow, expecting it will be easier then, or you will be more confident or clear about God's invitation. The same voice that spoke from a burning bush long ago still calls today with seemingly impossible requests. The question is, what is that in your hand? The simple metaphor that reminds you that God is calling you to be available because he will make you able. Lord, help me be brave and use my gifts for your service. I want them to be multiplied like it happened with the people in the parable of the talents. Help me trust that you make me able when I feel unable. Amen. Thank you.